يا اخي كافر نايس كو ودو جي دكاي هي नहीं दिखा है वो नहीं दिखा जो आपने राइट साइड में लिखा नहीं दिखा नहीं नहीं आप ऐसा इससे इससे वो क्या रहा है जो लेफ्ट वाली लाइन सही थी राइट लाइन आप दूसरी खींच दीजिए लेफ्ट वाली लाइन सही थी पहले हाँ ये अब दिख रहा है इसमें क्या है चेयर भी आ रहा है आपके साइड में जो है और फिल करिए राइट लेफ्ट की तरफ लेफ्ट की तरफ कर रहा हूँ परफेक्ट है परफेक्ट है दोनों लाइन दिख रही है दोनों और इसको इसको थोड़ा वर्टिकल कर देते हैं परफेक्ट हाँ ठीक है तो फोर्टी टू लेक्चर थ्री फोर्टी टू मिनट्स में देवर वाज द डायग्राम विच वाज हाँ Hmm. That's like diagram, sir. I remember. Uh, uh, that's in forty-two minutes. To do be such a oh, this kind spelling, kafi mushkil hai. We will ask Jizo uh, uh, to give the spelling. Or kal actually what happened is Sri Rang uh, even uh, talked to Jizo while I think we were talking. Uh, she, she actually we talked to. Huh? And there's very less work done on this. So the question is: Is there any information law like? Uh, so, jo jo upper wala hai, ori hai. It starts from there. Yeah. Yeah, I think we will confirm that today. Yes. So, uh, so this is the broad. So, if ori is on the top in one case, mm -hmm. the ori is opposite in the other case at forty-two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the question is. Uh, how does the organization happen? One is, uh, they, are there uh, some proteins which uh, tether it? Or, uh, so finally, originally, it would be some cell like this. And when uh, replication happens, my guess is the cell. Can I ask one even simpler question which can simplify from the modeling point? Bolo, bolo. This is the time. No, I'm asking. Let's say in the cell, inside the cell, the chromosome mm. ori is that have the preferred orientation towards some some side of the cell. Correct. Because but how does that come about? Ha. So no, I'm saying suppose the jo apka wo dot hai ori wala. Mm. It's let's say it's it can distinguish which side it's supposed to be. Yes. So suppose if it's like that, but when replication happens, replication mm. is the other daughter cell when it's created. The hmm. structure of the other side is in such a way that it somehow attracts to the go that side instead of just going by, going by entropy. See, suppose. Oh, sorry, Jaza, Jaza, Shaw is here, um, and just settle down. We have a lot of questions. We, okay. we, so let me. So that's Sunil Pratap Singh. Let me introduce you. Oh, yeah. Oh. So that's Sunil uh, yeah, Pratap Singh. Yeah. He was supposed to be here. But then we, we then we we decided we are going to record. So he said, yeah. "Okay, then I will." Oh wait, this is your student. I thought. No, it's not my student. Yeah, he's a faculty. And I said, uh, "Ali, no oh. Hi, Ali, hi, yeah, yeah." Hi, how are you? I'm good, good. Thank you. How are you? It's a very nice yeah. lecture. So I'm really enjoying it. And oh, I was supposed to be there, but some for family reason, I just kind of couldn't uh, come. I mean, I was about to come, but when I saw the option. And and then I decided to attend the online because of some issue with the family and my daughter is. Yeah, alone. yeah. Of course, it's much easier uh, yeah. to have so, the Zoom. So yes. other, if, if online option wouldn't have been there, I would. I was certainly there. I cancelled my plan at the last moment discussing. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was just. I, okay. I regret that I did cancel. I regret that I did cancel my. <laughs> I should have been there. 
Oh, uh, that's fine. I think this works. I, I'm going to put my um, AirPods on. So no, uh, uh, after some time. Okay. Yeah, because we are, uh, she are going to have some discussion before the formal start of the okay. lecture. Okay. So he is uh, like me, a polymer physicist. Uh -huh. It's just that I have started uh, this bacterial and DNA a bit uh -huh. uh, two, three years earlier. Okay. And so he does the same kind of modeling. He does all, I think he does some analytical calculations also. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, so the point is, uh, I mean, you know, entering a field. It's difficult, I mean, because yeah, you have yeah, to know course. so much. Yeah, okay. So he's attending the lectures. Mm -hmm. And what I told him that he can do a simple problem okay. to start off with. And then, you know, as you get used to it, you can get more and more. Okay. So the idea uh, I have uh, so for him uh -huh. is, uh, I first of all, you have to tell me the spelling oh, of okay. this bacteria. O-N-I. O-N-I. I T S I O N E I T S I O N E I T S I O N S I yeah oh. I think that's the right but I can't find out the right uh, I can't find out the right uh, I, I can send you the right you can send me the right one no so, so the, the interesting thing is that uh, so all this I'm stating it but mm -hmm. those are all questions and clarifications and we will yeah. add some uh -huh. more so so this is a cell, the bacterial cell, mm -hmm. and is when it is not replicating, is the ori has does ori already have a preferred orientation? No, it's not that. No, I think it's like this. It's oh, ori. Mm -hmm. ori and oh, okay. It's not, yeah. I'll listen to the paper. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So uh, you heard what she said, right? It's audible. And when there is replication, does the size of the cell become double? Yes. It's yeah. the yes, cell gradually. Double. So where the, the, the division point is developed right in the middle. So this gradually this widened. Yeah. This yeah. will widen. Widened. Yeah. So okay. just, uh, just curious, in more, more inside information in terms of the length scale. So this is also more like a cylindrical kind of rod, like uh, it has a larger length and the smaller weight aspect ratio of this. Uh, how many I, microns? This one actually is much larger. I think the weight, this one's much larger. I think it's, uh, it's three to four times the weight. Oh, okay. So it's much larger. The range here is at least about three micrometers. The width, I think it's this is about one. Yes. And, and sorry, uh, how about the width? I, I missed missed the width of the. The width might be about one, one to two micrometer. I don't remember exactly, but they are larger than E. coli. They are. I mean, yeah, it's. A, I I would if I go width to length ratio, it's like a half. It might be roughly half. Uh, they are a little fatter and larger than you could like. I mean, I think it's yeah, it's three yeah, yeah. or five micrometer in height and about one to two micrometer. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the precise right. What upper has written ratio? That's that's I just into the paper. There are um, quite some good work, uh, but they're all at the level just immunofluorescent because they can't do any genetics on it. Uh, it's at the level of. Immunofluorescence, like they can only do imaging, they don't have any time lapse or lifestyle experiment. Okay, but it is already known that after the replication, they not only segregate, uh, but they are. After the, so I think what they have is that during the segregation, your orange start moving this way, your pairs start moving this way. So there's some type of a rotation. I don't know if it's rotation or, or actually what replication. It is. But there are some type of orientation, but then they end up with this confirmation after segregation. I don't know if this is really a, a fork measure, a movement or not. Okay. You you want to model this? Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. give him. Uh, uh, is more like a, 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 can it be more entropic interaction than the something or more energetic interaction? It's is just, it already I, known? I don't know. No, I do not know. I have to go back to the paper and check again. I don't even recall if they. Okay, I have to check. I mean, I don't know if they have a part uh, 
as a B system or not. So just, uh, I mean, let's clarify more. So what Apratim has drawn the left hand side, the picture, this is just before the replication. Yes. Just before division, they are uh, anti-aligned. Anti -aligned. Yes, they are like transverse. People call this like a transverse position. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there a high map at level? No chance. See, this is a very primitive organism. Like people cannot culture it. Oh. Okay, that's yeah. what I see. I, I, I can follow up more with this particular bacteria. You are interested? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I so, know the author uh, fairly well. Um, I, I can follow up more, but I don't think they have done um, They have done too much. I mean, because it's only like one piece. So depending upon uh, uh, what they yeah. do, we can look at it as an entropic thing, if that's possible, but some more info. Yeah, uh, let me, let me uh, come again. for Because actually, okay. now I start remembering, they actually said they may have a power system, they may have an anchoring system. OK. Maybe some um, you know, immunofluorescence experiment. But the anchoring system, OK, I mean, you can anchor it, but the, still the polymer has to. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Like, you know, like, yeah. No, I just don't know too much about okay, the system. No problem. But I can send you papers uh, and I can dig out a bit more if you want to try this one. He, he will try. Uh, I have enough. I can't do too much. Okay. Right? So, I, so, uh, okay. so let him try this uh -huh. one. And I already have some polymers, architectures, and depending okay. on what, uh, at least you will get a starting point. Okay. And once it gets started, I'm sure we'll have more and more questions. I can, uh, I mean, he can do something, I can do something. If Mithun is interested, is Mithun there? He can do yeah, whatever. I know if it's <laughs> yeah, Max. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's one thing, and we will get more information. Okay. So we can get started playing okay. with polymer architecture. The other thing I am interested in, and I'll tell you the context. Uh, you said Chrysinthes is uh, has a helical shape. I think in the oh, past. Well, Chrysinthes doesn't. Well, it has a curved shape, not helical shape. And that's the cell. Yeah, the cell. But, but in terms of the chromosome, you have always oh, been. Oh, you mean the chromosome? The yeah. chromosome, you have always been drawing. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. I don't know how to draw, uh, but you yeah. know, you have been like drawing like this. Structure. And if you, it has a different. If it has. Yeah, you have been drawing like this. You said if, it ha if the imaging has. Sufficient resolution, you can see this. Something like that you said. I don't. It, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Now, in the past, uh, Cisdecker and others have looked at a uh, helical shape of uh, equally chromosome, I think, and Bela Mulder has a model of it. The how does helical uh, structure uh, emerge from overall organization? So it seems this helical motif is pretty common. Is that for, a correct for, statement? Well, I think for color background, this is what I think. Yeah, I don't know what I don't remember for what. Uh, Nicola has it twisted. I mean, but that two are fairly separate, but I don't think people call it a helical structure. Like, I don't like call it. Say, yeah, I, I uh, but you are saying that the two arms are like this. I mean, inside the cell. For Nicola? Yeah. Yeah, they are more as separate. Yeah, but then they can still have a low. You know, you know when yes. sometimes when you see, if you see someone with a nuclear imaging, mm -hmm. you can see the nuclear actually many different. Sometimes you have like one stripe of the fibers there. And okay. Out. Okay. Yeah. But I don't think people would call it helix, but they are open. But there are yeah, yeah, there are. Uh, and for colobacter and mm -hmm. subtilis, at least they, they call it even helix. Yeah, based on high C, not the other. High C and also model. Oh, there's already modeling on how yeah. twist uh, arises, how this helical not motive. Too, not, it's, it's a very big helix. It's not yes. like a multiple round. I think it's like half of a thousand type of the twist and this of the surface if you look at the modeling paper. Okay, I will look it up because we have quite some work on helices uh, and we'll, we'll talk about. I think you should just continue. Okay. I'm sorry because everybody is here. I don't want. Uh, you should put on your earphones. Yes, on Why is it so hot? Let's see if it's connected. No, one minute.
Can you in the Zoom? Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay, I can also hear you. Oh, that's good. All right. Well, thanks for coming again for another two and a half hour. Let's see. Okay. So today we're going to discuss about saddle skeletons. Um, so my 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 idea is that when we are discussing cytoskeletons, we are going to simultaneously discuss cell division and also cell shape. The reason is that most of those cytoskeleton proteins, they actually have very important roles in cell division and also cell shape. So it's hard to separate those two. So the first thing is that um, cytoskeleton is a very old class of proteins that has been there for many, many years. And you know, based on the name, you know it's you know, cytoplasmic skeleton protein. So they are more like a scaffold of the cell. So the bacteria actually was originally thought that they do not have cytoskeleton mm -hmm. because they're like a bag of enzyme, right? So, but then so it was really discovered that cytoskeleton also exists in, in bacteria cells. So there are, in eukaryotes, there are about three major types of cytoskeleton. Mm -hmm. So um, can someone in Zoom uh, mute themselves? So the first type is uh, tubulin. The second type is actin. Then the third type is called intermediate. intermediate filament. So those are three types of major um, cytoskeleton proteins in eukaryotes. I mean, many of you probably, if you have a little biology background, you probably know most of those uh, tubulin form, you know, 13 stranded, you know, microtubule. I think the diameter unit is about 25 nanometer. This is a GTPase. And actin class, they are, you know, ATPase. And they form very, very thin, thin you know, like a uh, helical structure. It's very skinny. It's about six nanometers in width. And intermediate filaments is actually a large class of different uh, uh, proteins. The reason it's called intermediate filaments because it's form a structure that's when the intermediate uh, weighs about 10 nanometers. So that's, you know, it's, it's kind of, so those two classes are very well conserved. Intermediate filament has so many different types. Uh, you know, you, you all probably know all of those. So it turns out the bacteria has all of those three classes. And they have another class called coiled, coiled proteins. And um, so how do you, classify a cytoskeletal protein in bacteria cell. A beginning is based on the sequence homology when those are all those typical uh, proteins, then you, you find many, many different types. But then later on people discover, especially for some other proteins, um, that they actually does not have any sequence homology or structural homology, but they actually execute some type of uh, cytoskeletal um, functions. So now this, uh, bacterial cytoskeleton, this term is very, very broad. This basically includes all those proteins that can make filament, or even if they do not make filament, they actually have some sorts of cytoskeleton functions. So those are all you know, just grossly uh, looped together as cytoskeleton. So because this is such a large class, so what I decided to do is that I'm going to pick one at each class. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to cover the coil coil because there are very little things that people know about it. Uh, and use you know, those examples to illustrate their functions. For example, for uh, tubulin, I will many talk about FTSZ. And actins, we actually have already discussed quite some of these actin proteins, but I will discuss in our content mean D, E system and also the uh, MRED. For this intermediate filament, I will discuss one protein called 
presenting uh, CRE as in Clobacter. So those three are probably the most well studied systems and really can help illustrate their function. FTSC is related, of course, in cell division, but it's also related to cell shape, uh, especially for this uh, pomorphogenesis. MinDE uh, related to cell division, as I will show, and also related to chromosome segregation. MRB cell shape. And this coincidence uh, is also related to cell shape. So I think when those um, when those sets of proteins, we probably can get a good understanding of bacterial cytoskeletons. Um, and now by, by just looking at those proteins, you probably also get a sense of what they actually do inside the cell, right? Either they are scaffolding, have a structure function, or they are more um, related to motility, for example, MinD and also FTSC uh, in the cell. So they carry out those typical functions uh, as a cytoskeleton. The what? So the same group as part a. Yeah, part A, yes, exactly. For the, yeah, well, people not, not acting, not acting. Yeah, it's the type of ATPs, but not acting based, uh, 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 not acting based uh, ATPs. Very good, yeah. So I, I put them together because uh, they are uh, all have this uh, ATPs activity. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to focus on FTSZ today. Um, yesterday, when I talked about it, uh, I talked about top Z. So I'm not going to go over this one again. Again, tap Z is uh, very similar to FTSC. It's another tubing homolog, uh, but today I'm mainly focused on FTSC. All right, so. FTSZ, um, this actually is the first protein being discovered. Like actually the gene was discovered like 30, 40 years ago was the first protein that discovered that um, uh, uh, belonged to the cytoskeleton class. Cause it's uh, when, uh, for, first of all, this gene is actually called the filamentous temperature sensitive protein uh, mutant Z. Uh, I don't know why people name it Z, but once I run into Joe Lukenhaus, who actually named this gene, he said uh, he doesn't want to go for any A or B or C because that's just going on. And he said, I'm just going to name the Z and that's the most unique thing. No one can surpass Z. So that's quite called FTSZ. And FTSZ was shown actually, uh, I think in the, uh, about 30 years ago, was showing a beautiful study that if you have an antibody against FTSZ, and you image that on, on a cell. I really love this study. It's one of those earliest ones. So you use a gold particle to image Z under EM. You get very sparse labeling of FTC. But then you see that this, I'm sorry, I'm not drawing this one. So they saw that FTC is just simply always at this leading invagination, leading edge of the invagination membrane. Because the cell is symmetric, right? Because when you lay down the grades, they can take any of those 360 dimension. Then uh, Joe Lucan has deduced that FTSZ must form a ring structure. So this is the first naming of this ring. Then, but then very soon, um, very soon FTSZ was discovered to be a GTPase, it's a hydrolyzed GTP. But then the structure was solved, then the structure of FTSA almost identical, I mean, very similar to tubing. So that's really the first time uh, young uh, Louis actually caught, well, <laughs> no, it's you know, the first cytoskeleton protein of bacteria. So, so this one has the longest story. So what is FTSZ? FTSA actually is a fairly short protein, it's a small protein, it's only six, 46 kD. So it's from a polymer, it's binds to GTP. So if I draw a polymer, it has a polarity. For example, if I see a, a GTP binds at one of the cleaves, 
over here. So they see called the top and they see called the bottom. So FTSC polymerized this was again figured out by Joe Lucan you know, very elegant genetic mutation experiment. He figured out that the new polymers at new monomer adds on this and from the bottom part. That's actually different from FTS, uh, from tubulin. Always add on this part. So there is a polarity. So you remember when I gave my talk the other last week, we showed that this polymer can treadmill. The treadmill has a directionality. So this one always add, and this one with the hydrolyzed TTP and become, uh, um, and dissociate to the, uh, you know, then exchange it with the GTP, GDP inside, this, inside the cell. So this is how the whole polymerization uh, works in, in E. coli. I mean, this is a trap meaning, but- Does treadmill have a special meaning in biology? What does the word treadmill mean? Treadmill is, it's a, it is a special word to describe this uh, uh, cytoskeleton. Um, cytoskeletal protein dynamics. It's basically this continuous polarization at one end and so continuous the depolarization at the other. That is generally called a trap meaning. So in a way, you are not having this whole filament, a static filament moving across the plane. So that's a direct, that's a direct movement. This is called trap meaning. Yeah, it's a very typical. Tubulin actually has a different type of dynamics. So FTC, even though it's a tubulin homolog, it's actually quite some different dynamics. For example, the um, people think that the GTP and GDP can actually exchange within the filament, which for uh, microtubule, people don't think that's really happening. But its effect will be something will be effect uh, move. Look, yeah, apparently it looks like this whole filament is apparently moving around, even though every single monomer is going to be different, not going to be the same monomer. Right. Yeah, so the because it's such a dynamic um, structure, there are actually lots of interesting uh, work and also modeling work going on with FTSC's um, uh, dynamics. Uh, the earliest work actually showed that if you if you have a cell inside, uh, if you have FTSZ, you know, labeled inside the cell, you can actually use one type of experiment called a FRAP. So how many of you know about this type of experiment, FRAP? Um, yes, yes, very good. Fluorescence, recovery after photo bleaching. So it's a very typical experiment people use to monitor the dynamics. So what happens that if you bleach part of the ring, if there is, uh, you only bleach over here, so you still have a last like unpolymerized FTSZ monomer inside the cell, right? So if you have a continuous exchange with your ring uh, polymerized FTSZ, you are going to see the fluorescence gradually, gradually recover. Then if I plot this, plot this is time, and this is uh, fluorescence intensity. Then original intensity is over here. After photo bleaching very quickly drops to you know almost zero, then it's going to gradually recover to original intensity if there is exchange. So this is the first experiment to show that the FTSZ ring, this polymer is highly dynamic and this recovery time usually is about 10 seconds. Within 10 seconds, this whole Rain's intensity pretty much can be recovered, which means that this is really exchanging very rapidly. And of course, this rate is dependent on the GTPS activity of FTC. If you have a low GTPS activity, it takes a much longer time to recover. So people know that this is related to GTPS activity. But of course, later on, our group and other group together show that this actually due to the uh, trap meaning of FTSZ. Um, uh, this uh, um, a polymer dynamics. But even when we discover this track mini dynamics, I want to pose a little challenge to our sister here. Okay, there's still something that the numbers do not add up. Okay, so let me explain that one to you. So in track mini, in all those different species, we measure the track mini speed 
is about 30 nanometer per second, okay? 30 nanometer per second, if we are just assuming a single FTSC filament, each FTSC is about five nanometer. So 30 nanometer per second means that I have to add six monomer per second, right? So 30 divided by five, six. In order, because we show that this is a steady state, so your polarization rate is the same as your depolarization rate. Now I should say at this end, we also should dissociate six FTSZ monomer per second, right? Now we know this process is dictated by GTPS activity. So what is that? This basically means, you know, the, the common hypothesis and the commonly acknowledged model for FTC that the site will dissociate when the GTP hydrolyzed to become GDP. Okay, so whenever this one become a GDP, the interface changes, this will drop off. Okay, okay. So then this would mean you need to every second, you need to have hydrolyzed six GTP per second. So this will be the estimated GTPS activity of FTSZ based on the track meaning speed. Yeah. Okay. So, but what is the experimentally measured GTPS activity of FTSZ? It's five per minute. So it's like one to 60 volts difference. Five per minute, approximately you can say one GTP per 10 second, you know, uh, per 10 second. So there is like about 50, 60 folds difference. So how, how would we explain this? I asked one of my collaborators. I say, you know, the GTPS so activity measure. measure the size of wind. Is it initially if it has a certain length, right? So, so when it's treadmill, what is the steady state length? Okay. So when it is tread meaning, um, so Try to mean at 30 nanometer per second, the lifetime based on this FRAP measurement is about 10 seconds. Yeah. So we can estimate the average length about 300 nanometers per length. So that's about six monomers. So I have one filament on average 60 monomers. And, and I. Six are being added, but things are not dropping off. Well, yeah, the, it's, it's a study state, right? So the number added should equal to the number dropping off. That's also what we measured. So the two ends of speed are almost identical. So, but this treadmill speed says that we need to hydrolyze six GTP per second. But in reality, when we measure biochemically, we purify GT, uh, FTSD, we add GTP, we measure the GTP activity. Our measurement is like 0.1 GTP per second. So there is a big difference. A what? You mean the uh, inside the cell, the GTPS activity will be higher? It's possible, but. Yes. Yes, yes, we thought of that at the beginning. But if you use a purified FTSZ in vitro, treadmill speed actually is even higher. It's not 30 nanometer per second, it's like 40 to 50 nanometer per second. And that is independent of any other factor, only need a membrane tether like FTSA over there. So so I don't think it's other, I, I mean, I think it's still possible. Uh, but I think it's unlikely that some in vivo factor would enhance the GTPS activity like 60 volts. Yeah. The speed is actually similar, but in vitro is slightly faster. In vitro is about 40 to 50 nanometer per second. Um, we measure in vivo is 30 nanometer per second. So slightly higher in vitro, which we think it. Well, we don't know exactly why, but I think those two numbers are very comparable to each other, not hundreds of volts different. And the speed which you're mentioning, especially in the 
Yeah, based on the, we, we can measure the chymograph, the processive motion of one cluster of FTC across the middle of the cell. So that's in vivo. That's in vivo. Oh, in vitro, oh, in vitro you, you, do, you can do the same thing. It's you can, not it's not, it's, it's none of those are single filament, but it will be the same, right? Because we are measuring the distance. Even if you have multiple filaments, you multiple filaments have still simultaneously do the same thing. So on average, every single filament would still be doing six monomer, adding six monomer or taking out six monomer per second. The what? The rate of addition at both ends are the same. It has to be. Yeah. Well, if we they are if they are not the what well, we measure, they are there. They are the same, which makes sense because if you are not the same, if you are having higher addition rate, the filament is going to keep growing until they deplete the cytoplasmic pool. Then the rates of addition will slow down, right? Because it's a bimolecular reaction. But you can still get a constant treadmilling speed. Yeah. If you have a, say, you have a constant speed of addition from one end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You can actually measure. So we that's how we measure. We can measure the leading edge and also the treating edge speed. So you can, for one single filament, you can be different. But on average, if you plot hundreds of filaments, those two ends of speed as a histogram together, those two histograms are almost identical. So that's why I see on average, all those filaments are in steady state. But for individual filament, you could end up with higher or lower. But the spread is not 60 folds different. The spread is most of the time it's going from like 20 to 40 nanometers per second. So the spread of that distribution is not huge. Because even in actin treadmilling, the yeah. two ends are not the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah, well, because actin is constantly growing and doing the work. Mm -hmm. And here for FTSC, actually, we don't think that's the case. We don't think it's the case that you continue to grow and shrink, continue to grow and shrink. We, we, from what we have seen inside the cell, they're always in this status, they just continuously moving around. They do not have to be the same, but for most of what our measurements, they are very similar. But even if they are not the same, the speed we measure the variation does not account to a 60 folds difference in GDP hydrolysis rate. So that's the question. So we are measuring the hydrolysis right at the end. Ha. Because I mean, it's a slow process. It could happen some. There are 60 of those monomers. It could start earlier and leaking out, but falling out might take more time or something like that. That's actually what we're thinking about. So I actually have, I wanted to have someone to model this process, put in the chemical reaction, because I think that actually may be the only way to explain, well, maybe not the only way, because we can also argue that the dissociation is not the GTP hydrolysis dependent, but I think that's probably unlikely. So exactly as it was, so we have been thinking about when you measure the GTPs activity in vitro in a tube, what you measure, you measure how many GTP being released, I mean, phosphate being released. Then you divide by the total protein concentration. And that gave you this, you know, 0 0.1 can GTP. You, can you go through this in study in more detail? Because so okay. how do you measure? Can you repeat this? Okay, so we measure GTPs activity. We purify FTSE. We add a certain buffer magnesium and GTP so that they would polymerize. So basically, we 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 constitute to FTT FTSE polymer in a tube. Okay. Then we measure the phosphate release. So could, because every single time one GTP hydrolyze, you reduce you they generate a pyrophosphate. Then we have another enzyme to hydrolyze it, become phosphate. We basically just measure how many phosphate being released. And that's coming from the hydrolysis of GTP. All right. So from that, we can then we take, you know, over this amount of time, this is how many concentration micromolecule of your phosphate being released. Then we take that number, divide by the total protein concentration of FTSZ in the tube, divide by the time. That gives us this turnover number. Even if it leaks out from here or here, you it, would measure this. Yeah, if, also... if they leak out, yes, yes. So it doesn't matter. If, if for example, if the hydrolyze over there and leaks out, then we would measure exactly the same way. Right? So that's why we divide by the total concentration. 
But based on this type of analysis, we start thinking maybe they don't leak out only the chip so is leaking out the high, or only the chip is hydrolyzing GTP. And that's where you are reducing your total protein concentration by 60 folds because each filament is 60 monomers. So your protein concentration in this equation become the concentration of a number of chips you have. So the number of filaments instead of a number of FTSZ monomers. That's what we think it's happening, but we have never done any explicit model to do the calculation to see if that is correct. So, so you know, we, we have a test tube. We have all those protein. So in the conventional way, you take the GTP phosphate, well, concentration, divide by the protein concentration. What I'm trying to is the yeah, yeah, FTC is the protein, right? That's the GTA. Okay, and FTZ, total amount of FTZ in the It's the same. Fixed. Yeah, okay. it's a fix. Because it's going on and on. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, it's okay, a fix. Okay, so okay. what I'm proposing is, I don't know if this is right or not, I'm probably instead of dividing by the FTC monomer concentration, okay. I actually divide the concentration of FTC polymer. And then this one is a six fold relationship. The total FTSC monomer concentration divided by 60 give us the number of FTSC polymers. Okay. And that is the number of chips that's actively. Got it, got it, got it. Right, yeah, so okay. that would give us the 60 fold higher. But I don't know if that is true. I, I, I think just by calculating, um, uh, you know, putting the actual hydrolysis cycle into the model and, and model that one with the tradmine. I wonder if that will be able to match the tradmine speed. And, but that give us some other thoughts, like they cannot hydrolyze in the middle. Even if a hydrolyzed phosphate cannot be released. Yeah. So that actually involves some, you know, structure interpretation, which we don't know if that is true or not. Because before people said that, this is open structure. It doesn't have this uh, capping. You know, the phosphate can, GTP and GDP can freely exchange. Maybe, maybe you can help. Yes, yes. I'm pretty sure that they can. Um, and FTC filaments can actually break in the middle. So, but this break, so if this one get hydrolyzed, become G, G, DP and the phosphate, there's supposed to be a little difference in the conformation. So make this one more prone to break in the middle, right? But I don't know if this is where, um, you can still hydrolyze in the middle, but you may not detect the phosphate release until it's a break. So I don't know if that is true. Oh, can you measure the GDP release? GDP release can be measured using the any any process that you can Oh, using the, the, the regeneration system, yeah. Uh -huh. oh. Yeah, 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 the light scattering. Yeah. Yeah, from the structure, I, I mean, the structure pocket is fairly exposed, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the T7, yes. Yeah. 
cannot be explained. Okay. Yeah, we need some structure um, information. Yeah. So what I provided is just a simply a mathematical calculation. And that's how I think of this can, can work. But I don't know if this would work and also whether this would actually fit to when the structure work. It can be, it's, it's a collection. It's a has a distribution. This is just average. And GDP is like a waste product. Once you release the energy, then GDP will work. Ah, so and how will it form when it becomes and phosphates are Yeah, about one to five millimolar inside the cell. It's always saturating concentration inside the cell for GTP. So what we are thinking about, the moment it dissociate the uh, GDP or whatever it's going to release, then GTP can come in and reconstitute and come back again. That's what well, that's what I think, but I don't know if it fits with the structure model. Can you say modifying? A chemical biochemical model just reconstitute this whole Z ring inside a cell based on the number of molecules of FTSC concentration of getting those uh, hydrogen uh, I mean, no no just the kinetic modeling not a molecular dynamic modeling just purely by calculating you know GTP concentration, GDP concentration, phosphate concentration, cell okay. FTSC concentration and cell the treadmill speed if from we that yeah from that perspective yeah. by who oh yes 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 i remember they had about physical journal paper for that but they i don't think they counted for just the teeth right i think they uh, looked for along the filament yeah so it is along yeah mm -hmm. Say breaking of the membranes, yeah, then like the rate for each of these events, like obviously, what they cannot have is to do the plates, which they can to simulate, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that one, yeah. I remember that one, but I don't think they still assumed they still assumed that the hydrolysis occurs throughout, and then you just randomly breaking up, so. Yeah, so I don't know. Yes. So when you calculate, uh, I, I understand that you have phosphates for the polymer Yeah. But what happens is that about the PK concentration. Yeah, they are all in. Get a constant number because then it's always uh, like you have monomer concentration plus the polymer concentration. Now, oh, okay, I see. I see. So because you you see that actually in the reaction, it's yeah. not always. So it's actually a mixture of both the monomer and the polymer. But yeah, only the polymer component. Yeah, will be capable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what right. Uh, oh, then you adjust with the proportion. So, what you do is if we do this at different concentrations, so only when we are above the physical concentration, do we get a constant value of the Yeah, because below the physical concentration, you have a change over those polymers. Very small amount of protein contributes to the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Because when we did this measurement, we did not really differentiate those two. We just divided by 
the total FTSD monomer concentration. And that's why our actual measurements in our hands is actually lower than what's reported in the literature. We're actually quite puzzled for, by that one for quite a while. But I now think it's quite because so of the... Mm -hmm. like, you know, the Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So when you say you get a constant value, constant value based on normalized against the FTSD concentration. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Then yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they're majorly they're majorly uh, polymers. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, uh, so. <laughs> okay, so so this is just the polymer dynamics of FTSZ. But the major function, of course, of FTSZ is to direct uh, um, uh, to direct cell division. So what they do is that when yeah, uh huh. Of TSA. Yeah, FTSA probably uh, how much higher? It's only charge Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's when I start remember. If you add zip, actually, you inhibit FTSZ, TTPS. Is that right? You form yeah, those yeah. bundles, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. FTSA actually help with the polarization. So that's probably the reason why it's helping the GTPS. Yeah, we are into the Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it can okay. be a difference. Yeah, it can be, I mean, like you said, there could be in vivo factors, even in vitro experiment, they have done it towards FTSA. But I don't think that will still, that will explain this 60 fold difference. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so I actually I, I do start thinking likely is um, the polymer um, making a difference. So the actual cheap hydrolyzing hydrolysis rate is higher than what we measure in vitro based on this the whole protein concentration measurement. In other words, we have to be some other process going on so that this whole thing can move so fast, right? Very good. Okay, so FTSZ would come to the middle and form a ring structure when cell is about to divide. And, and if you calculate all the FTSZ, for, for example, in E. coli, there are about 4,000 to 5,000 FTSZ monomers inside the cell. And we measured that's only about 30 to 40% of FTC are in the middle. All the others are still soluble in the cytoplasm. Now, if you take that calculation, in the middle, you only have about 1,200 to 1,500 FTC monomers. Now, if you see, I, I have all those monomers had to tell this become a long, long, long filament, it's going to be like about six micrometer because each one sits about five nanometer. So six micrometer long filament will only be enough to wrap the cell around twice, right? So cell diameter is approximately, I mean, we're doing back of envelope calculation about three micrometer. So if the Z ring organization size cell is really the long chain wrapped around, you know, twice, each one is only five nanometer. And if we assume that they are adopting a very tightly packed confirmation, then you should see this ring is only about 10 nanometer wide, right? So, or maybe a little higher based on the in vitro, um, this liposome type of study, they have some gap in between, and but that will give you to about 20 nanometers. So when we first did FTSZ ring imaging, trying to figure out how the filaments are organized inside cell, we saw that this width actually ranged from 60 to about 100 nanometer. 
So it's much wider, even though you know we are still limited by resolution after we decouple out all those resolution issue, the minimum in this range is always about 60 nanometers wide. So it's much higher than this 10 nanometer or 20 nanometer based on this uh, long chain polymer, uh, polymer model. And also we, I mean, I have already shown this in my talk. What we saw is that we saw this quite like bundles along the middle and they're fairly loosely associated. And, and you know, like basically have those different clusters and usually for each bundle, we calculate it's about 300 uh, monomers. Monomer of FTC in each one. Now, if we take this in vitro value about 60 monomer on average, that went about five filament. So in a way we have like five or six filaments of each cluster. We have like about four or five of those clusters in that cell. So it's a very unconventional structure of a polymer in the middle of the cell. And of course, we later on show that this structure actually is really important. It's dependent on uh, FTS, this GTP activity. And then other groups, including uh, quite a few different groups from Ethan Gunner's group and from Siemens Holden's group, they show actually, uh, and also early on from Bill Magoni's group to show that the assembly of the Z ring is actually very interesting. There is like a condensation process so when cell is about to divide, you have all those FTSC polymers like along the cell that like just very randomly diffusing. But as the cell about to divide, they start coming to the middle and start lining up with each other. And if we measure the density, the density is basically the total fluorescence intensity or the number of molecules divided by the volume over time, over the constriction time when the cell becomes you know, much, much more constricted. What we saw and also shown by other groups is that the FTS Z range in ten, the density actually gradually goes up to about 50% higher. And at one point, that's that very sharp decay. So this, we can also put, this will be time or can be diameter. So this is about 600 nanometer diameter. So this is starting about 800. So this was a very interesting phenomenon at the beginning because so basically you don't see much FTS Z ring disassembly during the time, but the ring gets sharper and sharper, more and more dense. But then at some point, the whole ring just starts shattering around and just leave. And this point usually is about 300 nanometers. So towards the end stage of cell division, the Z ring is not there anymore. So, so this phenomenon at the beginning, people start thinking about FTSZ, this condensation based on polymer dynamics can generate a constriction force. And that's how you pinch the cell in the middle. And there are actually a large amount of modeling work went into trying to model the polymer dynamics, stiffness, you know, flexibility, membrane thickness, um, membrane rigidity, et cetera, trying to see whether the force can you know, generated by this type of process will allow the uh, the constriction of the ring. Yeah. So, what really understood, I don't know whether I understood your seminar properly. The message I took home is the FTZ goes round and round, and that actually is distributing the uh, proteins which cut. That was yes. Understood. Yes. Okay. So that's after we figure out all oh, those. Okay. <laughs> so this that was at the beginning. At the beginning, that people saw this phenomenon, then trying to see whether this was actually generated. And this was supported actually by one very uh, famous work by uh, Harold Erickson, you probably know. They actually reconstituted this whole uh, ring. They are using FTSC, they put on an artificial membrane tether on FTSC, then mix it with the liposome. Then they were able to make those uh, long tubular liposome. Then they can encircle. FTS Z ring in it, just Z, FTS Z and the liposome and the membrane tether, even not FTSC. And what they saw that this ring actually can constrict just by itself to so buy some type of polymer dynamics. You can actually bring the liposome to this constriction site. So that's where all of those constriction theories started that you know, FTS Z ring can generate a lot of force. But based on calculation, if I remember correctly, 
the first FTSD each so the, the idea is that when FTSD is tethered to the membrane, the filament has a straight conformation. When the hydrolyzed GTP it has become bent. This actually is supported by structural work. So there are some certain curvatures when you have a different uh, nucleotide bond. And this type of curvature will be the one generating a bending force to bend the lip liposome. Yeah, but I think people did the calculation and the force that's generated is actually very, very small, even compared to E. coli chromosome, uh, E. coli membrane. It's, I think it's in the range of about picanewton. We actually did a little calculation before. It's just not going to be sufficient to pull, you know, pull the membrane inwards uh, against the turgor pressure of the cell. And even for this experiment, it was shown that even you don't use GTP, you use a GTP analog, that's a non-hydrolyzable analog, they can still constrain. So in a way, it's like a typical polymer not energy dependent polymer dynamic can deform the membrane if your polymer has a certain uh, rigidity. Not a normal polymer, it's an polymer well, no, if they replace, if they replace GTP with the non hydrolyzable uh, GMP and P, it's well still constrict. Oh, so right. there you, you don't have this dynamics. But now I think we know better. It's probably actually has a lot of those. Uh, 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 dynamics actually would really matter. And the FTSZ is not the one that's really generating for, but it's for a long period of time, a lot of, yeah, lots of work actually focused on this. And we actually also spent quite some time trying to figure out and turn out actually it's not the case. Uh, it's, it's rather but, it has a role in distributing the- Yes, which yes, we, yes which then actively constrict the cell. So FTSZ, the fourth generation mechanism, I think right now uh, people are fairly um, have a consensus with each other. So FTSZ it could still generate a force, you know, by the conformational change, but that force is not large enough to constrict the membrane, to bring the membrane together. It's likely actually provide a guidance, which I will show a little later. Yeah, yeah, I, I will show. Yeah. Not one continuous filament. How long they get? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where we calculate on average. You have about uh, the the filaments on average about three hundred nanometers long. long. Long, yeah. We see about sixty monomer. So that's based on the treadmill speed times the lifetime of the polymer of this monomer. That's how we calculate this length. And also based on our imaging, we can also see they're actually larger than a diffraction limit to the spot. Yeah. And uh, this dissociation is sharp association with that. Is it somewhere related to the practice? Uh, okay. That, <laughs> so, so we still do not know uh, why it's actually uh, start to dissociate at that curvature. So like you say, it's possible to be curvature sensitive. Like you know, when your membrane is so bent, it, FTS cannot accommodate, but no one has really shown that. We're actually trying to do that measurement ourselves, but you know, you have to make all those angles. There is one work actually showed, um, showed FTC still treadmills along different angles. Treadmill speed doesn't change, but they did not show whether they prefer the preference if there is any curvature sensitivity. So we don't know about that one. So that's one. Second, that it's also possible some FTSZ associated factors are also leaving and that's causing FTSZ dissociation. But we, again, we don't really know. We don't really know what is uh, that. But that, that bring me to, to this point where FTSZ come to the middle, it's really tethered by two proteins. The one is called FTSA. FTC has a, a amphipathic helix. Then you know FTC. This is the real acting homolog. I mean, to be it is not. I right? put it the wrong way. So this is the acting homolog. This actually binds to a small C, C terminal domain of FTCZ. So this is A. This is Z. And this is a major 
membrane anchor to bring FTC to the cyto uh, to the membrane. The ratio between A and Z is about one to five. You know, this is based on just protein expression level, so it does not mean inside the cell um, ring it is like this. But you you can imagine you probably have you know every five FTC you have one anchor. Okay, then you also have another membrane titer called the zip A, which is also still very mysterious. This has one transmembrane segment, very, very long disorder domain, and the globular domain has FTC interaction. So, in a way, FTC is tethered to the membrane by those two major proteins in E. coli. In Colobacter, there are more of those. In uh, Bacillus, there are also more of the, but those are, you know, the major player that's always come together with FTC to put FTC ring onto the membrane. Now, once this one formed, some people call it a proto ring, then you would have all the other cell division uh, protein, like more than 30 in E. coli, come together and reconstitute this whole thing called a division. So I'm not going to much details about all those because those are really more like uh, alphabetic soup of all those different proteins. Uh, uh, but I do want to mention one work that we show before that um, we show that this FTC can use the treadmilling speed, uh, treadmilling to function as a motor to drive other proteins across the membrane. So one of the protein we look at, for example, is FTSI. So I, I did not really talk much about this mechanism, but you can imagine that if you have a continuous polymerization on one end and continuous depolarization on the other end, but then you were able to drive a protein across the membrane directionally over uh, along the septum. So this is really a motor function. You have directionality, you have the cargo, you have the nucleotide dependent movement. So even though bacteria cells do not have those myosin or kinesin molecules, they have those cytoskeleton proteins. So they are, you know, they are the major player for those uh, not the cell motility but for molecules motility. And this mechanism, we propose this is a Brownian ratchet model. It's in a way it's actually similar to what actin does push things. So what happens is that those protein always have some C-terminal domains. C-terminal domains actually interact either with FTSA, the tether or, or with FTSZ. So three factors. One is the diffusion coefficient of those protein. So this protein is a membrane protein is always diffusing around. Another factor is the binding affinity between the protein and the FTSZ. Now, the another one is this tratamine speed. So those are three factors determine whether your protein FTSZ can actually be carried by FTSZ. So for lots of businesses, you can plot a sort of phase diagram, and we can show that only within a certain range, for example, this is FTSI's diffusion coefficient, for example, if this is 0.001, this is 0.1, this log scale, and this is the binding affinity. Only within a certain range that you can, you will actually have this type of phenomena, which is quite um, interesting because we actually measured, we measured the speed, we measured the diffusion coefficient of those proteins in different species, in uh, E. coli, in Colobacter, uh, E. coli, pneumococcus, and also Bacillus they all have to be within this one range predicted by the model to show this type of uh, movement, uh, directional movement. And you, the, we can also show, for example, the run length and also run uh, time of this molecule. And this is just a follow of very uh, um, classic Brownian rational model, you know, how, how, how long your molecule can follow your motor uh, is fairly stochastic, but it has a characteristic uh, wrong time and also wrong loss. And that's in a way determine how well your FTSZ can distribute those molecules along the middle of the septum. Okay, so this time that FTSI puts some time and then it drops off. Yes, then it and drops then you, off. It gets, uh, uh, Others can come. So in a way it's a random very stochastic interaction. We can you can think about it as the septum, you have this train running. 
and those molecules are just randomly diffused around. And sometimes they diffuse nearby the binding potential between those two are trapped and they hop onto the train and being continuously carried to another place. Then for some reason, we still don't understand what is it. They would dissociate and then being captured by other complex to start doing the synthesis, or they can come back again and start being moved around again. So, so that's the model. And now we're actually working with a, a collaborator trying to model the true track model, to model the transition of those molecules on and off between those two, because the transition rate and also the distribution of the transition time can tell us what type of chemical process that would be. It's a random process or it's a regulated process. Talking about distribution, and later you will say what creates the force, or um, I I will say a little about uh, what create. Okay, let me just say that. So we think what's cre creating the force. Okay, this is actually the part we are trying to model. I we think what's happening during cell division, what's the force, is actually the glycan chain extension, the glycan chain synthesis, and we think what's happening is that the division happens in a spiral fashion. You continuously spiral down, and that's how you actually constrict the cell. We actually did a calculation because the linear speed doesn't change, but every single time your diameter change. So your diameter change over time is accelerating. We actually can measure that uh, rate, and we found that actually match with our experimental uh, our experimental measurements matches with our theoretical calculation. Yeah, the, the, they, yeah, yeah, this uh, uh, change over diameter over d over t is increasing because the linear speed is constant. Yeah, so we think that is how. So in a way, you don't need actual any force. You actually need the guidance to to guide where the glycan strand is inserted and fix them in place, which is done by those enzymes. What is the importance of glycan strand? Glycan strand being extended, being synthesized, being extended, and also being placed at the right position underneath the previous glycan strand, and then being cross-linked. Mm -hmm. So that's how you actually uh, reduce the diameter during the division. And glycan strand, uh, strand is, you told me they are between the two lipid. Uh, yeah, between the two membrane. So that they are constantly adding. Yes, constantly adding. So that's where we think that that's the driver for cell division. You need the cell. So you know, for bacterial cell, cell division is really about cell wall constriction because they have to reconstruct the cell wall. And that is the rate limiting but step. Uh, if it keeps on adding, oh, it will form a layer after so that. So it, it's for E. coli, it's a hemisphere. So that's why I say it's constantly uh, spiraling down and also extending. So you end up in the hemisphere. For some other species, for example, uh, uh, Septilis, uh, Bicetilis, where you have, they actually synthesize one septum, like one flat plane in the middle. Before they actually can be cleaved. So, different cells have a different mechanism, but they all have to form this septum or plane in the middle. That's, you know, uh, cell wall formation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what? Is it in between the. We, we, we actually still also do not know what zip A is doing. So they pay in, in vitro study, if you add they pay, they pay inhibit, you know, re induce bundling of FTC, and that's inhibit the TTPS activity. Um, in vitro, it's in vivo, it's absolutely essential, but there are some um, genetic mutants that can bypass they pay. We still do not know what they pay is doing, but we. Oh, we actually think they pay bunch uh, at the shrinking end. We have an experiment that actually shows they pay is very much like FTS that keeps in tracking. And it's only on FTS they track, just keeps moving together with the FTS. But we don't know what's the actual function because it, it, it's, yeah, we, we, we don't really know too much about they pay. Uh, but looks to us, it's, 
it has something similar to FTSN. I mean, I don't know if we, okay, okay. I, yeah, we should. I think then when we come back, I want to discuss all those positioning system, which has a lot to do with those other set of scabs and protein. Okay, so when do we come back? 50? 50. Five zero? Well, 10 minutes. Okay, we're going to take a break for 10 minutes and come back at about 3.50. Thank you. Thank you.
Recording is on. Yeah. So, in the, in the next uh, one hour or so, uh, I want to cover some very interesting mechanisms for Z ring position. Because FTSZ is really the one that's, you know, um, determine where the uh, cell division plane is. So where FTS is even going to be become a very important factor for cell, uh, for cell division. So based on past studies, there are actually turned to be many different types of regulation for zero position. And you can, uh, you know, largely see them as if one is a positive regulation, one is a negative regulation. So I want, I want to start talking about the factor regulation for FTSC system. So how does a cell to choose the division plane for the cell or for the FTSC to form? So largely there are like three different, uh, actually let's say two major types of factor mechanisms. So the first type is this very well-known MCD system. So MCD system was first discovered in E. coli. People still call it you know, type of uh, spectrum for DNA, but their BTPs are quite different from the active family. Um, so in the MCD system, in E. coli also, this this also in E. coli also with the series. They are quite interesting. This is also a highly dynamic uh, system. So what happens in E. coli, you would have three proteins. So mean D, so mean D combines to membrane, you know, has a, uh, has a membrane cavity sequence, binds to the membrane like a, like a dimer. And mean C, mean D is the ATP, it's a hydrolyzed ATP. Mean D, is another, I'm sorry, mean C is another small protein. And people can show that you actually can form this type of code polymer using D on the membrane. Now, BG is another protein that somehow it's also a dimer can come in and displace mean C out. So mean C will be displaced. And also stimulates mean this ATP hypothesis and also to displace mean D. In E. coli, this system is so interesting because of all those changes and interactions, what people usually see that if you label, for example, mean D, what you see that you see mean D is always oscillating, like, you know, half of the time for 10 seconds, stay over here, thanks, move to the other half of the cell move to the other half of the shelf and just keeps going back and forth. And what you see for this mean E, mean E more or less is like a ring, just like switching between D and C back and forth. So this was first discovered, I think, by uh, kids before in the 90, middle of 1990s. And this, this just constantly burning ATP going back and forth. And the reason it's doing this because this mean C protein Mean C protein, um, mean C actually is a, uh, mean C is a, a FTSZ polymer and inhibitor polymerization picture. Mean C actually has two legs, you know, one, two halves, one antagonize the longitudinal polymerization of FTSZ, another one antagonize the lateral reaction of FTSZ. So in a way, you just think about mean C is a inhibitor. And because mean C simply tag along mean D, 
tax allowance and fees. So when this show oscillating back and forth, you end up with you end up with the average concentration of mean C. So this is the cell access, and uh, this is the concentration. So you end up with the lowest concentration of mean C in the middle. And that's where only actually some kind of symbol. So you know, this is a natural regulation system. But since it's moving, oh. Can you give a reference? For, can I, there are so many papers about this. Uh, I can give you some. a paper. seminal paper on this that it's also. So the first one is actually the Pete divorce paper. I forgot the first author. So just this write the name and oh, this name is, yes, because so spelling you, yeah, the first paper was done by at Case Western. But if you just search at the mean D or solution, you can find there are lots of the radical model so, so this is a very interesting system. It just constantly doing this. Every you know, I think the whole cycle is about 40 to 60 seconds change the direction and this system can also reproduce it in vitro you just purify those green proteins you give a liquid by layer and mean e and mean d both are different binding proteins you see just the tagging of them and you can produce all those patterns beautifully and but mean e just constantly chasing off and why are they, they at the end? They recognize the curvature. Why would they sit at the end? Why would they sit at the end? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, why not here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a curvature sensitivity people think for mean D binding um, to, to this uh, curvature. That curvature also has a, a special type of liquid as a cell code. And that type of pattern liquid, they have a uh, accommodate higher curvature. So they often stay over here. But this is so interesting. Um, um, it can be totally modulated by temperature. For example, if you can do this in vitro system, you increase the temperature, the oscillation can go much faster, like four times faster. Um, but also you can do this in different geometry. If you have a, if you have a long filament, I mean, long chamber, like a cell, but much, much longer. Or you can actually give the cell division so the cell become one filament. This system only oscillates when the pattern about three micrometers. So if you have a, you don't have the cell out, they are just going to like oscillate back and forth by binding to the cell. And this yeah. is, yeah. One is the access of the I mean, yeah, say is the the of the it's it's by antagonizing the polarization of the FTC. It's binds to two FTC at the longitudinal. It binds, it binds it, yeah, it actually has two binding surfaces with the FTC. It binds it with the FTC and prevents it to form a polymer. But it's an accident, uh, it's actually for the woman activity. So the, the what? It's actually interact with the polymer mm -hmm. FTC and disrupt it. It's, it's a fine sound to polymer that just break it apart. So the ring just simply follows the, uh, the ring just follows. You can actually say FTC is even being driven by it. If you overexpress the expression, you can see FTC really can be pushed by the mean uh, system. And, and because it's do, because it's dwell longer time at the cell pole, so on average, you, you end up with just average everything together, time average, you end up with much higher concentration of delta if you may see on the two pole, but minimum in the middle of the pole. And if you delete the, the, the reason that the mean CBE system was discovered some time ago, not some time ago, is because if you delete those genes, the cells start to generate mini cells. Because mm -hmm. oh. the FTC ring will form at the cell mm -hmm. pole without DNA. And this actually turned out to be a very useful uh, yes. method for people to produce all nucleus cell. Like you have a vesicle that's with pure protein, all metabolically active. You can do a lot of experiments with the mini cell. 
with the water bodies of whole cones and sanitation problem. Because you, so basically what we does actually, when you're talking about two roles, one that's to prevent FTSD formation, then he actually is to prevent FTSD formation at the cell phone. And then this is an active selection. And if you are prevented, that is it can only come to the middle, right? Question. But this system is just so interesting. There are even more studies coming out uh, even nowadays. So there is a one phenomenon I call membrane uh, phoresis. Uh, this was done by Kaito Shiwa just a couple of years ago. They showed, she showed this in, again in on system when mean Yi and the mean mean D are just moving along the membrane back and forth you feel like you know sweeping of your membrane whatever you are attached onto your membrane be swept away by the waves of the DD. So they call this like you know, a type of a membrane electrophoresive but not electrophoresive membrane uh, uh diffusive what's the word diffuse uh phoresis so basically like literally physically the mean DE waves are pushing all the other proteins protein away. And there is a group in Taiwan who actually also showed that this is a way that they can actually look some of these membrane receptors around during the time of with uh, in different type of metabolism sensing. So this is a very, very interesting system. But maybe to to this audience that's not enough was uh, I think about six or eight year, years ago. There was actually another paper come out showing that BD, which has mean D actually because it's like a part, you know, a type of ATPS, it actually binds with DNA. It has a non-specific DNA binding affinity. And the reason they notice that because when you delete mean CD, you not only get this mini cell cell division of the type, you also get a complex segregation defect. And they did quite some set to show that mean D had this non specific DNA binding affinity. And the model they proposed to be that uh, this is also the DNA binding is HP dependent, just similar to the role in the cell division. When you have your chromosome in the middle, BD is on the membrane and it combines it with your DNA non specifically depend on ATP. Then it actually brings the chromosome to the membrane. And because it's going back and forth and I saw it's elongating, then those individual mean D on the membrane, you know, we like every single time comes over and tap it, tap it, tap it over time. And that actually helps with the segregation. I think the that people they also did uh, the radical modeling where they just purely put in this and talk. Chromosome is inside the nucleoid and away from the. Well, they can bring them to the membrane by binding to those non specific that they show actually, you can actually, because uh, you can use some plasma DNA with, you know, then the decombined, you can actually see that they are actually close to the membrane. So they think those two are actually dependent on each other. Okay. So, so chromosome has different segments. They are attached to the membrane. Like we talked about last time, that assertion actually facilitates to have something similar to this as well. So, so that's another model we show that just purely by this entropic segregation, it's not, not enough, not. and you need to add the UD for this type of be constantly targeted. As you are allowing cell division to go on, you have all this media on the side and pulling the DNA away. I mean, of course, but yeah. when it is going in the opposite direction, then it will pull because it's when constantly the, moving. Well, when they are going through, it's diffusing. Only when they come to the end of the bunch, of the, well, actually, that's probably not true. Uh, actually, okay, I actually, I do not know, but when they go in between those two, it's a very rapid process. So I don't know if that's the process, they will also still be able to tap it. Maybe no, but when once when they're going this side, thereafter they're coming this side. Yeah, I, thereafter they're well, going there, this there side. There is a process, yes, okay. So the, the, the process is that when me, me and Yi comes over, it stimulates the hydrolysis ATP by Mindy. That Mindy actually dissociates mm -hmm. the membrane and diffuses the 
reduce to the other side, where they be reconstituted in CHP, then they find out the membrane, then they will come over. So only mean G is constantly on the oh. membrane, but mean G and C, they would dissociate, diffuse very rapidly to the other side and find the membrane. So you say the same the reduction rates of mean G and that's mainly to go first and localize, and then mini comes and then just so there is a uh, lag. Yeah, lag. There is a delay. Yeah, there is a delay. Mini is the one. If they are uh, directed motion, if they are going from one to the other, I mean, diffusive motion means it, it, it's typically yeah, it's, random. So uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, diffusive but under quotes, I think, because in physics, diffusion means that there will be no they bias. Can, yeah, no bias. But what happens that when we need Watch me, G of me, G stay on the first one for a while. So, oh. you know, when this side is occupied, me, G cannot find it anymore. Oh. And then the diffusion of course will okay. come over there where you do not have me, G. That's how. So, it is not only diffusion, it is also coupled with the ATP. Yeah, yeah, it is coupled with ATP. You have to be stimulated, ATP, hydrolysis by ATP, then they the dissociate. Then there is a yeah. For a while, there'll be a lot of meaning. This side, so this D cannot exercise. Cannot. Over the other side. Yeah, there it can exercise. exercise. And concentration keeps on increasing gradually. And then we need to again go there, stimulate the yeah. hydrolysis, and then again this side. Yeah. So and every time MinD is diffusing, it will have times attached to the chromosome. If it's freely diffusing, I don't think it's attached to the chromosome. Mm -hmm. The chromosome MinD is ATP dependent. Oh. Yeah. And also, it's not specific. So, I was wondering in the context whether there is any, any sort of like dance medium part B. Because part A is a preliminary medium. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so, in Bacillus, it is needed by part B. So, there it's part A and part B. Yeah, yeah. So, it's sort of maybe acting as a replacement of part A. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. But because E. coli doesn't have a part B protein, so uh, yeah, I it's think it's unlike to it. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's, I don't know. I don't know who get which one first, but it is a very interesting system that people discover is one single protein that has a dual role, both in terms of delivery, uh, placement, and also tonal segregation. But I did not see any follow up work for this one. For the so I don't know what's the current status. This is Nicola. Oh, you mean yeah? Uh, the the group was a Victor surgeon, Victor Morgan, uh, from Hyderabad. This this was very interesting. They did have very convincing about time. Can you write down the name? But you, you can just search like a mini colon segregation, then you should find it. So, in facilities, it's slightly different. I think that's all the major control of the other mini colon system. So, in facilities, the whole case seems to be a little different. Yeah, yeah, it is recorded. Oh, so I will just go to the, yeah, I'll find it. So in Priscilla's, they still have the same mini-CHP system, but slightly different. Uh, their system, it's actually not also. So they have a protein at the pole, it's a whole membrane protein, D4A. Yeah. Yeah. So the space over there that you have another protein, like MinJ. Then you have the mean D. Um, oh, you also have the same mean D system. So I think that's right. Yeah, you have the, yeah, you have, they actually don't have the mean D. They only have the mean G C system and D.
actually be seen. But research that is totally static is actually only at the code. Mm -hmm. um, in a way that, so this also argues why do you need this also system in eco, like you are constantly burning energy. But here you only need to have this inhibitor at the cell. How do you prevent this one from, uh, from uh, prevent just the formation of the cell? And um, you know, people really do not know exactly why. Um, but I think someone said it because for E. coli, the two posts doesn't really matter. And you always just want to prevent that. And you have to this constantly give you a mechanism to detect the cell size and cell shape, etc. But for bacillus, if you only doing vegetative growth, this is fine. But if you have for uh, like a spore system, start developing this uh, endospores, then you're going to inhibit the uh, uh, formation. And that for this type of solution and not work. Coming back to this synaptic effect, the another organism is of course called bacter. It's very interesting that they all use a very different but very similar type of inhibition. So in Colobacter system, if you remember the cell that so remember the chromosome already, it's always attached over here with pop Z, uh, par A, par S, par B, etc. of the system. And it turned out that you actually have another protein called MIPZ. And MIPZ is another <coughs> part A like protein. And it's actually form type of ingredients over there so that your activity will never actually come over here. And only when the chromosome are elongated, replicated, then you have a new ORI over here, then you have the new MIPZ over there. Then you establish the concentration gradients. So then you also have the lowest concentration gradients in the middle. So that TCA will be the two symbol. So this is type of a, it's a protein based uh, natural regulation mechanism for TCA formation in, in those three organisms. But then there is another system. So besides this, we say this system. But besides those, I think the most fascinating system uh, for a TCZ main placement is natural system. Is this system called nuclear transfusion? So this is a really sort of half minute cell division with the chromosome segregation. So in this two model organisms, E. coli and also these vegetables, they're actually quite different. So what is a nuclear of, of Bushi, the way that you think about that, whenever you have a chromosome, FTSC cannot assemble on top of it, just purely by sheer volume, like you are totally occupied that FTSC cannot assemble. But there are actually some negative factors for that. For E. coli, it's emitted by a protein called SMA. Many of you probably actually uh, know about this protein. So SMA actually was initially discovered uh, by in some sort of genetic screen and found that this one is exactly lethal with the mean system. If you delete mean, cell has survived. It's just a little apparent. If you delete SLM, it's also uh, de facto, but cell can still survive. But if you delete both at the same time, the cell just cannot survive. That's called synthetic lethal. So that's how we discovered this protein called SL, uh, SL and A. What is the protein that actually is quite interesting? So, um, so this one actually finds a specific sequence, we we'll call that CMA binding sequence on chromosome. And there, when they did the second this was done by Tom Bernhardt, who is uh, in uh, treatment was this binding site. If you map it on the chromosome, this is the body. 
are all over the place except for the termination. So they only distribute along the half where you have replication, but they are not terminating. And this type of binding, um, this type of binding is very specific binding. So when SLMA, this protein binds onto both sides, they actually stimulate FTS and this GTPS activity. So now if you remember, if you stimulate the GTPS activity of FTSC, you're going to speed up the uh, depolarization because they're too high and constant upon the joint bond. And people think that is the mechanism that SLMA can inhibit FTSC for reformation on top of the uh, chromosome. If you have the nuclear, do not segregate, and have lots of SMA over here. And then FTC will not form because you have somewhat concentrated dislodged from the information. And only when when SM when SMA bound nuclear start moving away, and only when term region come to the middle, that all these connected numbers are moving with the FTC can form. And this type of inhibition is totally dependent on the DNA binding. So it's a very elegant mechanism for, for depolarizing uh, And for this, this, you know that this one is just um, destabilized at this element because in this mutant, like um, if you overexpress the same way, of course, the living does not work. But then if you can overexpress another protein of that, which I will mention a little bit, that is actually strengthening the human information and you can suppress this type. So it's really all those the forces are at a play in each other. Um, but if, okay, so by in Brazilis, so I will leave this picture here for now. In Brazilis, there is another protein. They have actually very similar mechanism, but they have another protein called MAC, nucleot or pushing uh, factor. This one is also has a specific DNA binding. The distribution of bodies, I think they have maybe 40 or 60 sites. It's more than uh, CMA. They are also attributed only among the organ and not at the term. This is very interesting. So both of those two proteins only really in the bulk of the group, not at the term. But this protein is very interesting. It's actually not only binds to the DNA, it's actually also binds to the membrane. So you know when they, they this this the membrane binding is dependent on the DNA binding. So now the mark C is actually the one really bring the chromosome to the membrane. So it constitutes some tethers. You can imagine because this this mark C is also expressed at a much higher level than the DNA, I think. Maybe at 1,000 copies, it's very highly available. So basically, you can have the whole nucleus. Now, you can imagine that this is your nucleus. This is very much tethered to the membrane. But not different from slim A in E. coli, not actually has no interaction with any of those duties of course, which is really not meant to surprise because slim A had very specific interaction with FTSZ. Not, they did all sorts of uh, hand passage factors in the For them, not does not interact with any of those. So the hypothesis for not committing the nuclear pushing for zero replacement is that simply, you know, your nucleus is all occupied uh, of all these membrane places, then your FTC zero does not have any places to form except in the middle. So this is a complete so spatial exclusion. Wait, so these proteins, both SLM and NOC, mm -hmm. they are inside the cell, they are sitting on the DNA. Yeah. The DNA organization. But so, FTSZ is outside, right? Because it's, it's not you know, outside, it's also inside. They're uh, inner membrane. They're all inner membrane. And they, oh, okay, okay. It's going not on the outside of the cell. It's no, even, no, no. They, uh, if I 
optimal what facility to have. But this is the inner movement. Oh. FTC is always inside symmetrical. So it's, it's taking the inner surface, yeah, inner surface and, uh, yeah, yes. and then creating a okay, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So it's always inside. This one is called a pattern plasma, which you know, only in those diagram, but on the supernatural cells. So those are where the cells go. FTC is always, it's a cycle. And thereby, the SLM can uh, release something which uh, prevents, uh, which prevents a PZ. It's not released, it's just binds to a tissue with a very high level. It's a very similar to a tissue. Okay, just cut it yeah. off. So you can only just prevent a tissue with polarization. Whenever you have a bulk uh, nucleus, Mm. SLM prevents a TSD to polymerize on top of it. Max also prevents a TSD polymer, but not by directly touching, but by physically occupying all this membrane space. That's mm -hmm. the box. So that TSD doesn't have any available membrane space. So they, they, they represent, once it forms the polymer, it can't move. It just blo blocks on it. Because well, I, I also think that they would occupy most of the membrane space so that we can. The, it will distribute itself because uh, because these proteins are small and the membrane surface will be big. Yeah. Four thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, well, okay. So Mark actually, if I remember correctly, Mark can also. Oh, Mark it will take the DNA also and um, uh, paste it so that okay now and okay. Yeah. No. No. I. I agree. I think okay. Because so, uh, four thousand is a small number, right? I mean, four thousand is not. Yeah, uh, to cover the, to cover the, the but, but I think they will also put the DNA so the DNA will go and hit so basically a case of the Not actually a spread on the DNA, it's like a party, it's like a party is actually binds and actually spreads onto the membrane, uh, onto the DNA so you actually can build a larger cluster. Oh. So, yeah. I think the proposal is a physical model just because it did not detect the actual reactions between not and so and and because um math is uh, like a hard being uh lot, it's also sinking shapes. So if you cannot start seeing all this kind of happening protein, how much of much will be created instead of going to salvation because of so so now you see those two different um, systems for the cities and the Nikolai. Those are the, uh, you know, so the mean system and it's the nuclear diffusion system. Those are the two major negative uh, regulators for FTCD. But we talk about there are also positive uh, uh, regulators for FTCD, which means that they help FTCD to form in the middle. So those are just, okay, those sites we cannot form, but there are also systems to uh, uh, to promote the formation of FTC in the middle cell. So one of the most well-known system now is uh, we have here. This this FTC is yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, we, we discussed so map sheet. If we draw the cell like the surface of the cross section, so there are quite some studies have shown that of course map sheet binds to the turbulence and so it's hard to reach map sheet. So you if you have both matches, then you have positive. So tur always comes to the middle of the cell, the third cell division. Then you have map sheet binds over here. Then our group and also other groups show that. It finds another protein called that B. So map she, if you look at map she's uh, position inside the cell, if I draw a cell and there's some image map she, map she is always a little off center uh, from the center of the cell. And we measure that map she is about, oh, this is not the right one. Let me show you. So if the nuclear is like this, we measure that map she is about 280 nanometer away from the center of the cell. On top of the map she, you have another protein, another protein called that 
This distance about 30 nanometer. Now on top of that, you have another protein. They're all poly polyprotein called DAP A. This is another about 30 nanometer. Now on top of that, you have that TC filament. Those are all direct protein protein action. And we can measure uh, either by us or also by this uh, ET or uh, what Jensen or some others do, and measure about 30 nanometer. So you really now you can see. This is a highly uh, layered system, like your uh, FTCC ring is not a floating around at all in the uh, ocean or something like that, but it's really has an anchor, anchor up to the uh, yes. chromosome or the terminal ring. And, and, and if, if you cut this segment by deleting only one of those proteins, what you found is that the FTC become much more mobile. It's like a raft on the ocean, now it's no anchor, it's a floating around, it's much more stable. But not only that, the imagination of the cell wall constriction will become much faster because now you don't have this chromosome blocking the constriction, deleted by any one of those. And also, though, all those structures become much more loosely associated because you can measure. The subunit is changing so in the absence of that key, you can see all of those structures become much easier. So, in a way, you really have an anchor point in the middle to bring them together. So, you okay, you, you really have your everything, the inhibitors move away, turn moves in, establish this anchor, so you securely put FTS in the middle. So, but this is not the only one. In, it's in this one. What? So the P, there is Mindy, there is a certain energy. So they have another protein called back Z. So this is a middle associate protein Z. So this protein is very interesting. This is the inner membrane. This protein has a, it's a membrane protein, has a membrane case, it has a short N terminals in the cytoplasm, that has a large uh, C terminal protein in the uh, paraplast protein as well. This is a, uh, in the cell wall region. This one has been shown, the N terminals has a very high binding affinity with the TS3. This protein always come to the middle of the cell before FTSD. So in a way, this protein in the neocompass is the one that mark the future division site for FTSD. In all the other bacterial species, FTSD is the one that mark the division site. Only FTSD comes here, and all the other protein come. But in this one species, pneumonia, this one protein is the one that marking where FTSD should come. And this turns out that this C terminal domain, which is very interesting, um, finds a special type of cell wall, a special type of uh, form of cell wall. People still don't understand why that is the case, but during cell division, their cell wall get modified, and this type of sugar um, only enriched in the middle cell that this map Z protein coming binds to those uh, cell wall. And this and terminal recruit FTS3. So this is another uh, positive regulation for FTS3 formation. So now you see all those different species, they have very elaborate uh, systems to, to uh, help the conditioning of FTS3. So in a way, the function of FTS3 is really, you know, the way I, we think about it is it's like a steering of a, of a car or a truck. And the chromosome here is a low block because if your chromosome does not move away, FTSV directed cell wall constriction will not go in. And those cell wall enzymes, FTSI and central I will have you, they are the actual engines driving this car forward. FTSV is really telling you where you should go. And that's the function, major function of this tubule. So in a way, it's similar to microtubule uh, 
but there are lots of pathogens, so that takes it is so totally different. Both children can have very different and new functions to be important. So I think that's all I want to talk about today. Um, tomorrow, then we, we will discuss the sub shape and other um, uh, satisfactory protein and other should they also decide the size? The what? Uh, the size of the cell? Which one? I mean, whatever you are going to talk Tomorrow? about, uh, MRE. The name shape. Mainly shape, no, yeah. not size. Not size. Not size. Size means so much. Size is quite common. Yeah, because. of different things. Because there was a talk, Susan gave a talk, but I. Since I knew too little, I didn't understand. There's this adder principle and... Yeah, th those are more um, phenomenological. Okay. I would say, if you change the cell shape, of course you change the cell size, but that's not the major determinant. The cell size is mainly related to the potassium of the cell, not related to the nutrient addition. Okay. If you say it's a pattern of the business, that they give you this a certain amount of nutrient how large you can grow into. Cell basic growth depends on what's available. If you don't give them enough uh, nutrients, they will not be able to add much more volume or surface. So that, that's different from cell shape. Okay. Okay. Ring formation can regulate the link. So there's a nutrient condition to a case of regulation. Oh, yes, the, in the uh, glucose transport of what it is. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, the U6G uh, transport system. Yes, so FTS is, but I think that's actually only to the same like, formation. Formation. Yeah, so you know, we delay, it depends on the nutrient availability that we delay uh, the information. Yeah, but in, but we just the link. Respect to the CD, there are some. That the diffusion link, the link it produces, yeah. actually decides when it is at the point. So they talk about diffusion as a measurement of length of the cell. Yes. So the yes. time it takes for it to oscillate to the other depends on the length of the cell, and the oscillation can be more periodic only when it's long. Yeah, but I thought the oscillation also means it's almost an invariable capacity. No, but that uh, stabilizes only when the cell goes long. Yeah, if it's longer. So initially it's not too long. So when the cell just okay. you have you have a small cell, the oscillation is not long. So the so this is in one of the NCD reviews. Yeah. So they mentioned this as a way of diffusion as a mechanism of measuring the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, uh, early, early diffusion is very really different. Yeah. I think bacteria cells, but honestly speaking, I think bacteria cells do not have a very active mechanism to regulate the cell density. The cell density is really as a consequence of different growth stage. I think one, one thing like Cell division being delayed or uh, being uh, 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 prematurely started, then you have a consequence in the cell. It's not like the waste, the waste is more active. Okay. 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 Thanks, uh, do you have any questions? Or? Any questions from Zoom? I think we're good. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so by uh, you have, so we'll catch up later, Sunil, or you want to? Yeah, we'll call, we'll talk later, yeah. Yeah, I'll send the recording, of course, uh, yeah, sure. note, because there was a lot of new information. Many of the words were very new to me as well, but it's okay. Some of these things uh, become important and you don't know what are these words. So it's good to have a exposure to these names. Okay, bye. Okay, thanks, Aptapin. Yeah, thanks. We'll, we'll catch up.